Well, welcome back to the PBL Roundup. It's a pleasure to be joined. You see him all the time on ESPN. You read his stuff on ESPN.com. Major League Baseball writer for many, many years, Jeff Pass. And Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Where are you? Because you're bouncing around all over the place, it seems like. Uh, I am in Prairie Village, Kansas at the moment, but uh, I anticipate I'm going to be in many baseball stadiums uh, across the country over the next couple of months watching this pennant race unfold. And it is unfolding in very interesting ways already, which uh, is somebody who loves baseball and who loves close finishes, especially uh, tickles my heart. I got to ask you, we're doing this program about the state of journalism in baseball, which, which in, in many ways can also be intertwined with just the state of baseball in general. You sure. broke the story last week about Fernando Tatis Jr. Um, w w without giving away, you know, your sources and how you break the story, but walk us through as a journalist about <laughs> some of the things you have to be very careful about, Jeff, when you're breaking a story of that magnitude. It, there's a very simple edict when it comes to a story like that, which is you cannot get it wrong. Can't get it wrong. Can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Can't get it wrong. Can't get it wrong for a number of reasons. Number one, it goes beyond me, my career. It goes beyond ESPN and, uh, you know, my duty to the company. We're dealing with human beings here. Yeah. And Fernando Tatis Jr., if he had not used performance-enhancing drugs, but was out there publicly uh, with, with somebody, whatever, you know, the, the magnitude of that person's following on social media or resonance uh, in the baseball community is, if, if he gets smeared with that and it's incorrect, then that's something that's impossible. You know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's mm -hmm. the worst kind of Pandora's box. So the, there's the, the human part of it the, that leads me um, and, and makes me extremely skeptical when I hear at like 1230 that day, um, there's word going around in the Dominican Republic that Tatis popped a positive. And so, uh, you know, my first instinct was no. And then my second instinct was, well, you know, I've seen stories like this in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's where having been around doing this for 20 years now, you know, I can draw upon those experiences where in the past I've been skeptical about information that's come out of the DR uh, mm -hmm. on a number of fronts. But when it comes to PEDs, it's been spot on in the past. Yep. And, and so that led me to, okay, who do I know who might know this information? Who am I going to call up? And I spent the next four four plus hours trying to find anybody who would confirm that this may be a possibility for me. And, you know, a lot of the people with whom I spoke uh, were not saying anything. And generally speaking, when people don't say no, that might mean yes, but it didn't mean yes enough where I could go and actually print it. And my threshold there, my standard there, is at least two sources with direct knowledge of the situation. Because if I have one person telling me, yes, this is the case, and let's say I get it in a text message, um, I have, you know, I have no idea if that person is, you know, somebody else has grabbed his phone. Or uh, if that person has some sort of long held grudge against me that they're looking to get back at me at the most sure. opportune and damaging time. I sure. mean, these are all the things that I have to think about, not just on any regular story, but particularly a story like this, where, uh, you know, the, the beginning, middle and end is get it right. Get it right before you get it first. But if you can get it first and get it right at the same time, that's the goal. Billy? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's real. That's a real easy answer for you, Jeff. But it's such a great thing for our, our – we have a lot of young students watching this. And it's, it's important for them to hear that 
that oh, care yeah. that you have to take take into that. Um, I'm going to uh, shift gears and get into the baseball. I actually, but um, so the you know, the exciting pen, pennant races for you is that is that uh, uh, derived because of the wild card, the you know the expanded wild card. You know, I, I think it's it might be a little too early to know how the wild card is going to shake out. Um, I I always listen. I, I'm not against expanded playoffs. I understand the realities of the business in the game. I understand that uh, executives want it because if you can say you had a playoff team, that's going to stave off the the wolves who may be coming for you after a year. Uh, I, I get all of those things. I, I'm looking just at the, the specific races that are – like the American League East looked like it was going to be an absolute runaway – uh, the Yankees are trying to make it so that it's not. Uh, the the American League Central, uh, listen, I don't think any American League Central team is a real threat necessarily to win the World Series this year. There, there are five teams in baseball that I think are elite. And that starts with the Dodgers. And then you've got the Mets, the Braves, the Yankees, and the Astros. And and maybe maybe the Padres can jump there. Maybe the Cardinals or Brewers uh, maybe the Mariners possibly, but I, I think that none of the American League Central teams have shown themselves to be at that sort of level. And yet you've got three of them within one game of each other in the standings and we're in the middle of August right now. So that yep. looks like it could be a great race down the stretch. Houston's running away uh, in the AL West, but Seattle and Toronto and Tampa and the Central teams and even the Baltimore Orioles all in the mix yep. – for those three wild card spots, it's a pretty great situation. The the NL is a little more defined at this point. Uh, my favorite race is Mets and Braves in the East. They're just they're two really good baseball teams, two really talented teams, and they both play pretty good brands of baseball. So I enjoy watching those two play, and I think they're going to duke it out down the stretch. Central, you've got the the Cardinals and Brewers. The, it's a two team race, but. Uh, there are two teams that have great strengths and great flaws as well. And then out West, it's, it's more like the Dodgers are, I mean, this might be the best version of the Dodgers that we've seen. And considering this was a team that uh, essentially won the division for a decade straight. And then the year that it didn't went out and won 106 games. Yeah. Um, this might be the best version of them. And that's without Walker Bueller. And that's with, Clayton Kershaw on the shelf right now. Um, but the fact that they're getting back Dustin May, they're expecting to get back like Trine and Bruce Argrotterol, that Kershaw's, you know, seemingly going to be okay. And that they have the lineup that they're trotting out every day. I mean, it is an incredibly deep and talented lineup. I love watching the Dodgers play and uh, seeing how the Padres react to the Tatis suspension and where they go from there. I mean, I just like I just named what 17, 18 teams that are genuinely in the playoff race. That makes for an exciting last six weeks of the season. And if that is what the wild card uh, precipitates, then hey, I'm all for it. Jeff, I want to shift gears a little bit. We were talking about, you know, the state of journalism. You just gave us a, a great recap on kind of where we are looking ahead of this final month and a half of the season. But I, I, I got to tell you. I used to argue when I was the, uh, announcing the Reds games, I used to not argue, but just go back and forth with a lot of the, the I'm not even going to call them analytics people. I, I'm going to call it, yeah, I am going to call them analytics people. Um, <laughs> about, about the state of baseball and the level of legitimate competition to compete for a World Series, a big market and small market. I get so tired of hearing about, well, Tampa Bay, you know, Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay. Uh, Kansas City was lightning in a bottle. They had a nice team. And I'm saying lightning in a bottle compared to where we are of playing and winning the World Series. I think mm -hmm. the reason baseball is in the mess it's in right now, and you may totally disagree, is because I, I still maintain the Milwaukee Brewers and teams like that, the Minnesota Twins, they're not going to win the World Series. They're not. They have to go through too many levels of juggernaut teams with payrolls of 170, 180, 200 million dollars. At the end of the day, the teams that are playing and winning World Series, you just ripped it off about the five best teams in baseball that have a legitimate chance to win it. Atlanta, Houston, LA, New York, New York. You agree with me on that or disagree? Because I mean, Look, people can spew Tampa Bay now till the end of time. 
they still uh -huh. haven't won the World Series. Yep. No, no question. They have not won the World Series. There, there are a couple of ways that I want to answer this. And the first one is what San Diego is doing right now. And, and I look at the Padres and the Padres are among the bottom 10 media yep. markets in yep. Major League Baseball. Uh, they are in an area, just a metropolitan area, if you include Los Angeles, that has three big league teams in it. So yep. it's not like they have any sort of monopoly over that area. And yet the Padres are floating payrolls out there of 225, 230, 240 million dollars. Uh, the Padres are signing Fernando Tatis for $340 million and Manny Machado for three hundred, and want to sign Juan Soto in the $500 million range. What that tells me is that market size does not necessarily have to matter. Now, I understand Don't some organizations... are an outlier, Jeff. Jeff, I mean, that's an outlier, right? I mean, this is the first I, I time the Padres have ever done this, and, and the franchise has still never won a World Series. Yep, They're that, doing it right now, but they've never done this before. No, no, they haven't done it. But my point is it shows that smaller markets can go out there if they have ownership that is willing to. Fair what enough. Peter Seidler has done is he has said, if we build it, you better come. <laughs> and you know what? Fans are actually coming right now. Yes, you they see, they, they have uh, like they had to cut off season ticket sales for next year because fans are so enthralled by this team. Petco Park is selling out almost every night. The ancillary revenues that are coming in there are enormous. Now, I don't have a look at the Padres' books, so I don't know how they're doing financially with the windfall that they're taking and spending on their payroll. But I think what it illustrates is that teams do not have to operate necessarily with a small market mindset and that every team can compete. Now, maybe it's for a shorter amount of time and where the advantage is with the Dodgers, with the Yankees, with the Cubs, with the Astros, with these bigger market teams that have bigger revenues, television contracts, et cetera, is that they can do this every year. Yeah. Whereas, uh, and that, listen, that buys you a lot of leeway, right? That buys you the ability to go out and make a hundred million dollar mistake and say, okay, that like that happened. That, that's right. That you know, that's just the cost of doing business in New York City. We can swing and miss and be okay. I, I look at Tampa, Tom, not as uh, a failure because the Rays haven't won the World Series, but as a, a bit of a miracle, honestly. Yeah, in this I agree with it, you on that. I, it, I like in this in this thought. environment, in this environment where um efficiency is important. And I, I don't like that part of baseball. Like, I don't like the idea that a team is going to draft or sign and develop guys. And that when they're at their peak and value, they're going to get moved like right. that. The, the, the whole, the whole farm system for the world thing, it just doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is the Rays are doing what they have to do in their circumstances to get as close as they can to winning a World Series. And uh, listen, anyone who's run a team before, Billy, you can talk about this. Winning a World Series is extremely difficult. Yes, and yes. it takes more than strategy. It takes more than money. It takes a lot of luck. And it takes your players happening to play well at the right time. And all you're ever trying to do, whether you're the Tampa Bay Rays with a $60 million payroll or the Los Angeles Dodgers with a $275 million payroll, is give yourself that much more of a chance, every little itty bit more of a chance to, to hit it right at the right time in October. You know, I think that, that's one of the, uh, you touched on it at, at the end there. That's why I don't have a problem. It sounds terrible, I know, but I don't have a problem with rebuilding slash tanking. Um, and I know I know most people do. And I, I, I get how abhorrent it appears, but um, but I do, I do know that in the system we're in right now, you got to do that. Even, even a big market at some point might find itself at, at, at some point where it has to re rebuild. Now, may, maybe not tank, but, you know, Baltimore, Baltimore is looking pretty good right now. 
you know, and, and, well, and I mean, Baltimore, Baltimore looks, Baltimore looks great. Now we also have to remember Baltimore looks great in part because they had those top picks and because Adley Rushman is awesome already. And, you know, you can make an argument by this time next year, he's going to be the best catcher in the big leagues. And I, I probably wouldn't argue with that. But let's also remember, it's not just the early picks they hit. Back in 2019, they took Gunnar Henderson with the first pick of the second round. Gunnar Henderson is now the second best prospect in baseball uh, by Kylie McDaniel, my colleague's account. By other measures, he's the top prospect in the entire game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they took Colton Kowser, uh, fifth overall, uh, I think it was last year. And that was an underslot deal. And He's done nothing but hit and is now hitting for power. And, uh, you know, they they doubled up uh, with Heston Kierstad as well. And he's a guy who's going to be a big leaguer. And they hit on Grayson Rodriguez. Like, it, it's one thing to get the draft picks. It's another to actually go out and <laughs> execute them the way that the Orioles are. And they cracked the code a little bit. Um, they've realized that if you catch the ball well and have a dominant bullpen – that's kind of all it takes to be a, an average big league team. Yeah. yeah they, they, they hit enough. You know, is there anyone in the lineup who really like Rushman's going to scare you, but right now and Mount Castle, like Cedric Mullins is a really good player. Ramon Urias, like the, it's not a lineup that top to bottom is going to inspire fear in you every day. But what it is, is they're good, solid yeah. baseball team that has a great bullpen. And with the reliance on relief arms these days, it's a formula that is tough to replicate because not many teams can do what the Orioles have done with their bullpen over the last couple of years. Yeah. Jeff, before we let you get out of here and we thank you for your time, um, as you may or may not know, a big part of our show this year, we've been tied into both the Falk School of Analytics at your alma mater, Syracuse University, as well as the Newhouse School, where we have students on our show every week contributing to the show. Uh, I know you grew up outside of Cleveland, Ohio and, and made your way to Syracuse. Can you talk a little bit before we let you go about that experience being at Syracuse and what it meant to you and where you are now? Oh yeah. I mean, it's amazing spending every winter day slogging through snow <laughs> and uh, yeah. trying to, to climb over. <laughs> no, it, uh, you know, well, I east side back. of Cleveland, you got a lot of snow too. Uh, now. Was, you know what? It prepared me. That is a, <laughs> yes, that is a great point. That is a fantastic point. Uh, I I look back so fondly on my college days, and I've been I've been doing a little more reminiscing of late about college because my son actually started high school today, and it's mm -hmm. very odd to me that he's four years away from going to college when I so vividly remember my first day at Syracuse University on the campus uh, walking with my parents into the office of the Daily Orange newspaper at 744 Ostrom Avenue and uh, that that was a transformative truly transformative moment in my life because that's where I spent almost every night for the next four years and where I learned everything that I've taken now and tried to apply both in terms of being a good reporter, being an ethical journalist, being a good person and trying to combine all of those things into one during my career. And the foundation of that was forged at Syracuse University, both in the classroom and at the newspaper. And I, I look at the school and uh, have nothing but, but great memories of it and of my time there and uh, know that all the kids who are there right now are getting great educations and doing us proud because uh, if there is one thing that there's a lot of in the sports media business, it's a uh, pompous, arrogant Syracuse University graduates. <laughs> you said that, not me. I yep. took my son up there to visit uh, back in the winter before his lacrosse season started. He's a senior in high school. I got to tell you, brother. That, that, that cold stuff hasn't changed since you left. Oh, no. No, it's very oh. real. Global warming everywhere except Syracuse. <laughs> I tell you what. The, you the, all the, the best, man. We thank you so much for your time, you, and this has been awesome. The idea that you uh, have a high school is, is just one more point at how fast I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, I, trust me. I'm feeling the same way, man. I'm feeling the same. I, I started pretty early, but uh, that being said, 
he's he's taller than me. He's more athletic than me. He throws much harder than I ever did. So I'd like to believe that he's simply a much better version of me. And he reminds uh, me that every day. We, well, we all hope that. that our kids are better. We all Amen. hope our kids are, be- are better than us. At least I do. I really hope mine are way better than me. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't. I I <laughs> want to make sure to have the, the superiority. Now, of course. We do. Right. Of course. The, hammer. the cons did hammer. No, I'm not <laughs> Thanks for joining well, thanks us. Thanks for your time, man. Been great to see you. All the best the rest of the year. Thanks for having me, boys. I appreciate it. All right.